My name is Sterly Wilder, and I'm a proud member of the class of 1983 and the Senior Associate Vice President of Alumni Engagement and Development. We're so excited about this talk back for Summer of Soul and have really been looking forward to this evening. And I'm so proud that one of the producers is one of my dearest friends and fellow Duke alum, Beth Hubbard, class of 1985. This critically acclaimed and award-winning documentary examines the 1969 Harlem Cultural Festival, which was held at Mount Morris Park, now Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem, and lasted for six weeks. The festival's focus was centered around the celebration of Black history, culture, museum, and fashion. And despite having a large attendance and performers such as Stevie Wonder, Mahalia Jackson, Nina Simone, The Fifth Dimension, The Staple Singers, Gladys Knight and the Pips, and Sly and the Family Stone, the festival was seen as obscure in pop culture. Leading our panel and discussion and the moderator for this evening is James B. Duke Distinguished Professor, Chair of the Department of African and African American Studies and Duke rock star, Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. Thanks so much to, for joining us tonight. We know you will enjoy this program. Now, Mark, over to you. Thank you, Sterling. Um, glad to be here this evening. Um, and if all the participants can now uh, put yourself on screen <laughs> so that we might see and meet all of you. Thank you very much. Um, so I was fortunate um, to be able to see Summer of Soul uh, last year um, before the film ran at the film festival um, back in January, which of course so many people got to do for the first time virtually, which by the way is the way to do it, is the way to do Sundance. Um, and I was floored then, uh, had a chance to see it a few times on Hulu since then and got a chance to see it in the big theater. Uh, and I'm sure for most of the folks who just watched it or watched it beforehand, uh, it is kind of a mind boggling, mind numbing experience to think about um, how powerful that film was and that the footage had disappeared for so long. Um, and so I, I really do want to just start with you, Robert, because in many ways this starts with you um, and your conversations with the late Hal Tolchin, um, who had hundreds of hours of this footage yep. um, in his home, uh, not doing anything. Um, and of course, Robert uh, Favalent is one of the executive producers of the film. Um, so how are you doing today, Robert? Good, good. Uh, yeah, just uh, going back to that history, I, it started about 15 years ago. And, uh, you know, I was, my background is as an entertainment lawyer. And so I worked uh, with a lot of distribution companies on independent film, and I was advising a, a friend who had some questions about how to clear rights for a music doc. And as we were talking, he started describing this footage and this legend of this footage. And I said, well, you know, I don't know about the project you're working on, but, you know, this is the project I want to work on. And, uh, you know, I sought out Hal Tolchin, you know, Hal had been approached over the years by different people and, you know, had been in talks to, to try to do something. But, um, you know, I was able to persuade him to, to work together. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, that's around the time that, you know, Beth got involved, you know, a few years later and, and, uh, and we set out to, to make this movie and uh, wasn't easy, but uh, the, sort of the timing was right. And uh, the, the we got a great director and production team and and found some interesting people to talk to some of which you'll hear from tonight and uh you know couldn't be happier with what what we got, came up with so I, I remember beth talking with me about the project maybe two or three years ago and, and it was mythical right it was like this mythical project and the new york times did a, did, did a big piece in the summer of 2019 talking about the Black Woodstock, right? And, and the Black Woodstock is a bit of a misnomer because the festival actually occurs, starts, you know, six weeks, seven weeks before Woodstock ever occurs. If anything, you know, Woodstock should be like the, <laughs> <laughs> the white hippie yeah. <laughs> cultural festival and, and not the other way around. Yep. Um, but talk about your reaction, Beth, when you first came across all of this footage. 
Well, I was stunned when Robert brought me this tape that showed some of the footage. I was blown away. I mean, completely blown away. And then when he got uh, boxes of tapes from Hal originally, and I brought it up to the house and started logging it. Um, I, I just couldn't, I couldn't believe, first of all, that it existed. I couldn't believe that no one had actually bought it from Hal, right? I, I didn't, I just couldn't understand that because it's such a cultural event. It's such an important piece of history. And, um, and then, you know, we went to Deluxe. We, we, we basically had them examine all the tapes and work on, on some of them and, and the music reels. And it was just, it was, it's just a moment in time in my life and, and seeing Oh Happy Day by the original mm -hmm. Edward Hawkins, was, that was a super important thing and song in my life way back in, in uh, White Rock Church actually. Uh, outside of Durham, North Carolina. So it actually proved to me there was something bigger than than Duke Chapel out there. But anyway, we won't we won't go into that. But at the end of the day, it was it was an amazing experience. And Robert and I, you know, we went around town and didn't get a lot of yeses. Let's just put it that way. We'll be very nice and won't mention names. But um, it was extraordinary how tunnel visioned people were about how important this footage really was. The first image that you see in the film um, is that of Musa Jackson. Um, and in fact, he has the last word <laughs> in, in the film also, right? The film is kind of sandwiched between this figure that is known in Harlem circles as the ambassador of Harlem uh, right. And of course, he was an attendee as a four-year-old. So I, before I even talk about your attendance at the festival, Musa, and, and what you remember, um, put Harlem in some sort of context for folks to understand why it was so significant for this concert series, this festival to happen in Harlem. What was it about Harlem? Well, as we all know, hi, you guys, I'm Musa Jackson. Um, and I just wanted to say, you know, Harlem at that time and, and still today really was always, I hope you guys can hear me. I'm at Art Basel. I'm having a good time here with my good friends. <laughs> I always have to bring people into my world. Um, when you say the Harlem ambassador, Harlem ambassador goes everywhere and where there's art, where there's culture, where there's music. So if you can imagine a four-year-old, here I am at 56 years old and I'm still doing, still doing it. But it was that moment in time in my life that really sort of ignited my passion for where I'm in today. Um, and really a lot of people, you know, Harlem was the cultural capital um, for Black America. You know, let's just keep it real, guys. And when you say Harlem, you think of Black people, right? You thought of a certain time, especially at that time. And so to have it, to bring a concert to Harlem was really significant at that time because the year before, as we all know, in 1968, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And what they were afraid of was that they had a few riots, that it was gonna repeat itself. So the idea to bring the Harlem Cultural Festival in 1969 was really, part of it was to squelch any type of um, riot disruptions that might happen in New York City, but also to bring us back together because ultimately it was a concert for unity. And that's why I was there. My family went as a unit. It was mom, dad, you know, it was, it was um, you know, uh, actually not my father, but it was my mother's boyfriend and my family and mothers and fathers were there. So I saw a lot of family members, everybody from my neighborhood went. Um, so it was really important and significant to have it at, in Harlem at that time. You know, um, and I think that's, you know, bringing those acts to Harlem, it had never happened before. You know, we had the Apollo, but we, that was obviously, that was a paid event. This was an outdoor free event that took place over six weeks. Can you see me? Yeah, we can. can you see me? Over six weeks. And um, it was just an amazing event. You know, and, and like I said, all the families were there and you had all the greatest acts of the time. And it was a plethora of different types of styles of music from gospel 
to um, to R and B, to blues. Um, you even had comedians. I don't know. A lot of people don't talk about that. But Moms Maybelline was there. You know. Um, you know, can you imagine Moms Maybelline and Red Fox, <laughs> two of the greatest legends that predated Red Fox and Eddie Eddie Murphy? You know, were there. Um, but it was it was a good time. You know, it was a magical moment. You know, it's obviously it's influenced my life. I, I want you to, to describe a little bit for the audience, for those who don't know Musa, about the landscape of Harlem in this regard, right? It was in Mount Morris Park, what we now call Marcus Garvey Park, right? To kind of speak right. of the changes that have occurred since that period of time. But where does Mount Mar where does Marcus Garvey Park sit in Harlem? Well, okay, you know what? Marcus Garvey Park is centrally located. So we have if people that don't know Harlem at all, they might know 125th Street, mm -hmm. right? So Marcus Garvey Park basically goes from 120th Street to 124th Street, from east to west. So you had East Harlem and West Harlem, central encapsulated in one park, right? I hope you guys can hear me and follow me. And so, um, and it's not that far from the Apollo, okay? So if people didn't know how to get there, they knew where the Apollo was. So, they, so that, was another, that was another reason why it was important to have it in, at that time, Mount Morris Park, okay? It's since been turned into Marcus Garvey Park, but it was Mount Morris Park. And so, um, and everybody knew it, you know? At that time, you know, the neighborhood, you know, had seen its troubles. Okay, so it was desolate in some places, a lot of vacant lots, a lot of uh, abandoned buildings. Um, this is obviously pre-gentrification. And obviously now the neighborhood has changed and it's become this place where a culture where people are, are reigniting um, the passion, the, you know, um, um, the culture, the art, you know, films are, are now being done there. Films are being done on Harlem, Godfather Harlem is there, you know, that was set in that time frame as well. So, you know, we've seen significant changes over the past 50 years in Harlem. Thank you, Musa. Um, you know, Patrick, uh, AK Ninth Wonder, there, there are lots of ways I could describe you. Uh, Grammy Award winner, uh, current Grammy Award nominee uh, for your project with Dinner, Dinner Party showing up on CBS this morning and ain't telling nobody that you're going to be on TV <laughs> up there with Nate Burleson and all, and all the folks. But, but at your core, you are an archivist, right? You are an archivist and a, and a curator of Black music. When you see a film like Summer of Soul, what does that say about the fullness of what Black music is? Oh, my God. Um, well, the first thing I was noticing was um, the reaction of the crowd. I'm used to seeing, if this is Summer of Soul, this is a music festival. And we look at all the music festivals we have now, Coachella, Rock the Bells, um, Rolling Loud, like all of these particular music festivals. I'm watching Summer of Soul from a standpoint of looking how the crowd is reacting to the music, especially the part when Sly and the Family Stone took stage, which Everybody was kind of, you had a few people in the crowd saying, okay, what is really going on? And then you had a, some people in the crowd that was really digging it. And it's kind of, at that particular moment in time, and it kind of showed the, the change from a one form of black music to a now new revolutionary form of black music. And so I was watching the reaction in the crowd of how they were dressed, how Sly and Family Stone was dressed how the music sounded, because they, they sounded totally different from everybody else, right? And then I kind of started thinking about, so how does that feel now when a new artist takes stage and it's kind of a shift in music? Because Sly and the Family Stone really shifted music like that. So I kind of look at it from that standpoint um, when it affects Black music, because that was a definite shift at that time. Like, I don't think people really understand, even from the standpoint of calling going from calling it Negro music to black music, right? Or black music or soul music. We haven't used the term black before until this came along. So um, that's how I, I was looking at it from, from that. I was excited to see who was always, on, always on stage, but everybody that took the stage, I made sure I picked out faces in the crowd to see how, they were, how their body movements were, 
you know, there wasn't a whole lot of like you see now, put your hands in the air. It wasn't a lot of that because there hadn't been we hadn't gotten to that point yet in music. Right. So we hadn't got to that kind of call and response, which which really begs on what hip hop brought, the call and response type of thing. We hadn't got that. It was perform on stage and watch us perform. Uh, we may bob our heads. We may look. We may put our hands up. I mean, we may just stare. We're not putting our hands up. But that's how I just looked at that. That how was black music changing from the '60s going into the '70s before it even gets to hip hop? So that's what I was looking for, pretty much. I'm gonna go back to you for a moment, Beth. Um, and this is something that Robert brought up in his comments: to thinking about what the value is of of black culture in the marketplace, but also in terms of as, you know, a critical cultural component of, of American society. You know, thinking about your work uh, on the award-winning uh, The Raper, Reese Taylor, um, you of course are also executive producer of the, of the soon to be released next year, Citizen Ash, the documentary about Arthur Ashe. Um, what kind of challenges did you face along with Robert trying to convince people of the value of this footage? Um, and, and what does it mean that, you know, 50 years later that, that there weren't people who thought that this was something that folks needed to see? And, and in, that, in that same kind of vein, have you been surprised by the reaction to the film? Well, I think, I think in our industry, there has been a perception um, in the last couple of decades that black films, black cast films, black films in general, what they are calling black films, you know, can't travel. There was all this, you know, in the, in the nineties and the early, you know, there's no foreign in black films. There's no, this in black, you know, black cast films won't make it, you know, past. And then you had, you know, brown sugar. And then you had different films that came out there. You had, you know, do the right thing, all spike stuff, you know, but still there was this fight about, you know, black cast films and black documentaries and, you know, it's, it's limited and all the, you know, and then I think Robert and I just, we couldn't imagine that people were shutting their door on, and, and there were, by the way, there were executives that wanted to do this, but it was about the financing and, you know, I think there were, there was this, we couldn't believe it because of how big the stars were. Stevie Wonder and the music attached to it. And, you know, it, well, it's just, you know, it, it's, it's gonna be a lot of, how are you gonna do the music rights? And really can, they couldn't get their head around it. And there were all these excuses. And you have to remember that a lot of times, you know, these guys say yes, and it doesn't work, their job's gone. That's the way they look at it. They're not necessarily in a job to say yes. Um, so I think we were we were just, you know, and and for what I've been able to to help, I'm just here to create platforms for people to get, you know, the the light shown on things and on, on important stories. And so for me, this was one of those. And so when I saw what what you know, Questlove and Josh Pearson, and I have to just shout him out because he just did a brilliant job in the editing of this film. Um, he also did Nina Simone's documentary, but I just felt like his work, Questlove's work, you know, when we saw the final cut, I, I couldn't imagine people weren't going to be blown away. I mean, as many times and as important as it is to portray Martin Luther King and then Martin Luther King's demise and death for you to be for you to experience that in the way you experience that for the way you experience Mahalia singing with 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 Mavis you know there there it's it goes be you have to jump up you have to be a part of it you're there and when you're there there's just nothing it is an event film and I just felt like in the moment that we were in there's just no way that movie couldn't move people. And I've watched people on the planes, you know, when they're watching it, white, black, Latin, they, they can't, they're moved. They, they're transfixed even on, on a plane. So I, I wasn't surprised, although you're always nervous, <laughs> we're still nervous. Um, 
but I think uh, I think it's timely. I think people also it is a, it was a time when you know musicians were really using their platform to get a message across about what was taking place in the world, and uh, and it was their personal platform to do that with. So. Um, yeah, I just think I think it's turned out to be a, an amazingly important film. Yeah, let me bring you into this again, uh, Robert. Um, you know, you and Beth are not black folks, right? Yeah. <laughs> at That's least as, far, sure. as long as, as in the sense of your presentation, at least, All right? But how important was it to find it? And I was struck by language that Robert has used in some interviews. Right? It's not just that you needed a black face to help sell it. Um, but you needed a good storyteller. And, and how someone like Questlove, Amira Thompson, was at the top of your list as a kind of storyteller that you need to be able to tell this story. So talk about, you know, bringing him into this sure. project. Sure, and, and, you know, I'll comment on being the white guy producer of this movie just for the fun of it. You know, I grew up in Florida down where Musa is right now. And, you know, I was like every other white kid in the, 60s and 70s listening to Led Zeppelin and Boston and Kansas and Journey and all those bands and then my mind was blown when I went to a school down the street from you guys at Tulane University and I discovered real music and so you know the thing that I experienced was you know the message of music can be universal and for me you know when I first saw this footage it was like opening a treasure chest and just seeing these performances. And I felt like, you know, if I can believe in this and I can see this potential for this material, other people, you know, are gonna, uh, are gonna need to experience it too. And so, um, uh, yeah, um, I forgot what your, I forgot what the Quest second Love part of your question was. a storyteller. Questlove is oh, a uh, uh, sure, Questlove, you know, when we, when we finally sat down and said, you know, how can we get this, uh, film to those people. We wanted somebody who could bridge those cultural gaps. And Questlove has, you know, worked with everyone from Elvis Costello to, you know, he's obviously the, you know, the, the leader of the roots. And, you know, I'd seen the roots many times and we just knew that, you know, this is a guy that can tell this story. And this, this film deserves an ambassador and a storyteller that would do justice to the material. And, you know, you know, he was a first time director, but we knew that, especially in the documentary film world, storytelling comes from, you know, experience and being able to, to um, you know, relate what you know and, and, and bring a voice to material. And so, um, you know, we knew he was going to be great. There's a wonderful question here from the audience, uh, thinking about the historical context of the film. And this is a pre-internet, pre-social media era how did they get the word of mouth out about? How is this marketed to folks? <laughs> you know, in, in a moment where you just can't go to Twitter or IG or TikTok and talk about this. How did folks find out about this? That's probably a Musa question. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, there, there we go. So, okay, hey guys. In our case, in my case, right? Um, you remember, I'm four years old. Okay, so <laughs> let's, let's, let's start there. But um, my mother's boyfriend lived ironically across the street. So for us, you know, we'd heard about it and it was no question because that we were gonna go to. I grew up in a family, you know, my father knew Malcolm X personally, um, was a, 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 a you know, member of core Congress of Racial Equality back in the 60s. Um, and so being a part of the culture and activism and, you know, was just a part of how I grew up from inception. Um, and so it's something like this that was free. It was across the street, was a no brainer. And we all went and, you know, I knew a lot of people found out a lot of ways through word of mouth. There wasn't any television ads. They weren't doing these uh, commercials for something like this. So it was a lot of, um, on the radio, you know, they, I think they were doing radio spots. Um, and like I said, word of mouth is and, what I know of. And, look, and I think like maybe Amsterdam News was, you know, um, our local Harlem paper that they, you know, remember back in those days, 
they were given like, you know, on the street, they gave out these papers and they would see what was coming up. Um, Amsterdam News, uh, you know, WBLS, um, stations like that, you know, were promoted. And we listened to WBLS and stations like that every single night. So, um, you know, and like I said, word of mouth. So, you know, you heard the word got around Harlem, you know, Stevie's coming. Mahalia's going to be there. Churches. You found out through churches, right? Because you had Mahalia, you had Mavis. So that's why I think, you know, they got a lot of the word out about this type of festival. I was going to say, you know, uh, just to that latter point, you know, churches were the social media of that time. Right. And you had Operation Breadbasket coming, you had all those uh, you know, gospel performances that were coming. And so, you know, everybody that was involved in making this festival had an agenda. The city had an agenda because as Musa said, they were trying to keep peace in, uh, in, in the community. Uh, the churches had an agenda. Jesse Jackson had an agenda through Operation Breadbasket in the churches. And the performers themselves had an agenda, which was to, you know, expose people to their music. And so, you know, they were doing all the things that they would do to promote the performance and their appearance in Harlem. So you had kind of everything come together. And it's why you look at how big those crowds are. I mean, it was like everybody was working towards one thing, which was to, you know, make this festival an important thing at that time in that community. So, you know, the, the, the study of this is, is what I do for a living, right? So, so I'm not expecting to see anything that just would go like, damn, I didn't know that <laughs> before. But, the, but there were two, you know, kind of reflections that stuck to me. Um, you mentioned Mahalia Jackson and the, the hearing Mavis Staples. I mean, that's also the beauty of, of the film, hearing folks who performed being able to weigh in. So whether it's um, Marilyn McCool and, and, and Billy Davis Jr. or Mavis Staples, but Mavis Staples and, and, and uh, Mahalia Jackson and what feels like a passing of the torch, you know, in that moment. And, and you mentioned Jesse Jackson because, you know, if, if I thought I understood who Jesse Jackson was before then, I watched this film and I understood, oh, Jesse Jackson was the hype man for the civil rights movement. <laughs> that, that's, that's exactly the way to describe him, right? Because he brought that kind of energy and attention to you know, whatever he was invested in in that period of time. But, but for all the panelists, um, you know, were there, what was a moment in the film in which you went, ah, I, I didn't know that before? Hmm. It's probably the Jesse Jackson moment it's, it's probably it's probably just a man just it's a whole lot of things man um I'm a sound person so the way the sound was set up like there's no this is pre everything this is pre we're gonna change the whole set of the stage before the next act and we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do like we hadn't gotten to that at all in music. It was definitely a free for all compared to the festivals I've seen even growing up in the eighties or the nineties or even participating in festivals. So just the way it was set up as far as how the stage looked, everything like it was, again, I was looking at it from a different lens being a performer, right? Instead of a spectator, I'm looking at it from the lens of being a performer. I'm just studying it like, Okay, so why do they have the piano over there? Why do they have Sly on that microphone? Why just that kind of stuff? Where are the speakers? Like, why do they have people all close to the stage like that? It's a whole lot of things that I was looking at. So, oh, so this is how festivals look in the 19, late 1960s, early 1970s. Like, I was looking at it from that standpoint the whole time. I mean, I think I think for me, I would say, you know, I think even as a country, we grew up thinking that the 60s was, you know, you, your vision is Woodstock. And so the thing that was surprising to me, I mean, I obviously I'd heard all this music before, but when you see that crowd in Harlem, you realize, man, there's a whole nother perspective and different kinds of people that are coming to see music you know that's not you know the the Woodstock image is not definitive of the 60s mm -hmm. and so you know I think it was really important that Hal who you know 
got a, gets a lot of credit because he didn't just focus his cameras on the stage. He he had a camera running just on the audience, and he knew that it was important to show that perspective. And you know, I remember as a kid. I mean, now everyone's has TikTok or Instagram, or they're they're making their own videos, whatever. But back then, people wanted to be on TV, you know, and they were like excited about, hey, I'm going to show the world my world. I'm going to show people where I live. And so I think that was one of the things he was trying to do was to say, this is not a one-way camera. This is this is us interacting with the Harlem community. And uh, that was really eye-opening to me when I first watched the footage. Like many people in America, I imagine now, um, I've been slogging through that six hours of footage or six, seven hours of footage of the Beatles. <laughs> you know, pulling together that last recording. Um, and, and it brings to mind that obviously for a film like Somewhere or Soul, there were choices in terms of what to include, what to leave out. And, and, to, and to make a finer point to, to Beth's initial shout out to, to, to uh, Pearson, um, it, you know, the, the genius of that film is in the editing, right? The fact that you can watch the film and not really get a sense that it occurred over the course of six weeks. It, it almost feels as though it occurred. And, and if not for Tony Lawrence's, you know, the Harlem Dandy, right. <laughs> without, if, if, if not for his wardrobe changes, you know, that, that's the only thing that clues you in. It's like, oh, that didn't happen the same day. Right? Well, there probably were a lot <laughs> even on the same day. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, what footage did, you know, what footage is there? How did you make those choices about what to include and not to include? And will there be an afterlife, you know, for some of the stuff that didn't make it into the film? I mean, one of the uh, audience members asked this question, like, you know, will we get like the full Mahalia Jackson performance or, or you know, full performances of folks who were there, you know, individually, right? Um, you know, Sly's voice was noticeably absent in the film, even as the footage is there, right? So just wondering about, you know, what the afterlife is for this project. So, you know, Questlove jokes that, you know, his original cut was five hours. Uh, he's, not, <laughs> he's, he's, not, he's not far off, uh, but, you know, it was tough to make choices. We knew, you know, we set out to make a documentary film. So we wanted to stick to the constraints and, you know, we we certainly had lots of conversations about which performances from the set of each performer and which worked best for the story we were trying to tell, which was the overall bigger picture of what this concert was about and what it meant at that time and for that community. But, you know, there are, you know, there's there's a lot more footage left and, you know, we, we are, I'm sure we will find ways to, um, to get that other footage out, you know, in a, in a follow-up in some way. The, the, the soundtrack's about to be announced. So that's a little bit of, I can, I can give you a little bit of a, a preview about that. So <laughs> that, that'll be fun. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, we, you know, this, this footage is not gonna go back into a basement for another 50 years. It's, you know, we want, we want this film to attract an audience and, you know, we will, um, find other opportunities, you know, moving forward, so. And, and again, to, to ask a question about the choice to make it a theatrical release. Um, you know, there's a way in which you see a film like this and you imagine it, you know, being on uh, PBS or something of that, or what was, what went into the thinking to make it something bigger, right? You know, we're here and talk now, you know, not only will y'all likely get an Oscar nomination for the documentary field, right? But you might actually get an Oscar op uh, uh, nomination for film of the year, right? So, so what went into making it big it, or, or bigger than it might've been imagined before? I mean, all I, all I can say, you know, even when Beth and I first started out, we first saw this footage, it was like, this has to be seen on a big screen. This is, you know, even though people are watching it now on airplanes, I'm like, okay, you owe it to yourself to find a theater to see this in, even if it's a home theater, you know? So we always envisioned it, not, not only because, you know, it, it, it lends itself to that, but because it is, the film itself is about community and watching a film in a theater is a communal experience. And if you don't get that, you're only seeing one aspect of this. It's like, you know, the same between, you know, going to a concert and listening to, to, uh, you know, 
your iPhone or whatever, right? It's it's that experience, and I think it. I think this film does does need that. And and you know, we were there's so many ways we got lucky on this movie. Not that some of it wasn't calculated or we didn't aim to do it, but the fact that people had been stuck in their houses for two years, it was like, man, maybe I can't go bounce around in a, a mosh pit, but I'm going to at least experience this in a, among other people. And, you know, we wanted it to be in theaters and we had, you know, once the film was finished, we had offers from people who wanted on their streamers or whatever. We said, unless you're going to put it in theaters, you're not getting the movie. And so, you know, we had to make some decisions there and, you know, Disney was great and that they committed to doing that from the start. And, uh, you know, that was really why we, we, we put the film in their hands. They understood the, the obligation along with, Onyx, their BIPOC initiative and Hulu. And, you know, we, we really felt like that gave us the broadest exposure. And this movie is about numbers and getting people to see it. And, um, you know, that's, that was our strategy. Uh, you, you know, Patrick, I see you nodding your head because I know you often talk about one of the big shifts in, in hip hop listenership is that there was a time, you know, where someone would hear a new Public Enemy CD or, or cassette and it'd be eight, nine people at a time listening to it together the first time. And we don't have that kind of communal experience anymore. Yeah, that, that was the most interesting thing about what Robert said. Um, timing is everything. Fate is everything. And after, after the year 2020 and the year 2021 with COVID and especially all the police brutality, this movie couldn't come in at a better time. And music is already a healing power as it is, but to see black folk around that turbulent time, the late sixties, early seventies, around the black power movement and the way the musicians or some musicians would get on stage and say something about the moment in time that they were in it was a perfect time to see this type of movie. I think we've already seen what was going on on TV with protests and riots and and everything. And some people even went to the point where, where to blame the music. A lot of people blame, you know, certain factions of black music or just music period about the power that it has to bring people together. And then this drops <laughs> and you're watching something as pure and as raw and as timeless as a film in the midst of everybody sitting in the house, in the midst of all of this craziness going on outside. So a lot of this movie, if not all of this movie was a bigger, I don't know if, if y'all released this movie to intend to heal people, <laughs> but I think that's what it is. This movie was right on time for f and fate purposes to heal folk. It took pe people back to a time where um, music sounded like that, which a lot of people feel like mu that's the feeling of music that's missing. Um, it was nostalgic. It was thought provoking. It was warm. It was a lot. And we needed that during this particular time. So, you know, 19... 2021 is a bit of a landmark year because um, it marks, you know, a 50 year anniversary of a bunch of critical cultural texts. Um, Marvin Gaye's What's Going On dropped 50 years ago, Sign the Family Stones has a ride going on 50 years ago, Attica is, is 50 years ago, Shaft is 50 years ago. Um, you know, Gamble and Huff launched Philadelphia International Records 50 years ago. Soul Train, right, go, hits television 50 years ago. And, and listening to an interview from the great journalist and writer Nelson George describing Soul Train as the civil rights movement secret, you know, it, Soul Train represented the civil rights movement's secret weapon. What their secret weapon was, was Black joy. So, you know, particularly for someone like Rusa, who was there, but all the other panelists, Talk about how significant, and Patrick kind of, you know, alludes to this in his comments, how significant and powerful is the presentation of Black joy, right? Not just to Black audiences, right? But to a broader array of folks. 
Well, I mean, for me, it goes back to the comment I made earlier of people's perception in this country of Woodstock being, you know, what, you know, young people at that time were doing. And, you know, you see this movie, you see the power of protest and the power of music um, being created by community, not, not, you know, uh, you know, it's giving people a different perspective than I think they would otherwise have on, on, uh, you know, that era and, the, and that community for sure. I've, uh, I got a more technical question uh, for you, Bob, and, and for Beth. Um, the clearing of music, uh, like, you know, I, there's so many of us that would love to get like some beautiful box sets of Soul Train, right? But you realize that for every one of those performances, you have to clear the rights to every artist and what their record labels are. And, does their record label even exist anymore and, and all those kind of dynamics. So, so what were some of the challenges in terms of being able to clear some of the performances that we see, you know, with the artists themselves in some cases, but most likely, you know, with some of these record companies? Well, I would tell you it would be like a week long Zoom if we had to go into everything that- That's, That sounds like a special class that you <laughs> yeah. should teach with Patrick at Duke. Yeah, right? I'd love, I'm just going to put that out there. <laughs> I'd love to. Right? <laughs> but what, I mean, I guess the short version <laughs> I would say is that, you know, there are, and I don't want to get lost in the legal weeds because I, I know I, you know, I do have a legal background, but there are people that make films that rightfully use fair use as, you know, in, 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 in their making of films. And we were- And, very, and explain fair use to, to audiences, you sure. know, audience who don't understand it. So, you know, the, the short version of it is, is that we have a first amendment and while um, there, Fair use is a defense to copyright infringement. So if you use certain things in the telling of, of journalism or in documentaries or things like that, you do have the right to use those things without clearance for, for that limited purpose. But in our case, A, we wanted to use as much music as possible because we did want the entertainment value of the songs to play long. And we also wanted to respect these artists. So we licensed every piece of music in in this film um without using fair use and um so you know but there were things as you suggested which were complicated like whether or not these artists had relationships with record companies and you know rights of publicity and and all those kinds of things that are all part of making any documentary but this movie was particularly challenging as you can imagine given the stature of these artists and and people involved so you know to make to the hip-hop comparison again i mean one of the things that changed sampling practices in hip-hop is when folks suddenly had to pay for samples. Um, and so it limited the kind of sampling that could be done, who could be sampled. Uh, do you have any concerns, particularly with the success of a film like this, that that will remain kind of a challenge for really good musical documentaries in general, but particularly documentaries around Black music? Well, I mean, I would say this, it's a complicated question, but I would say at the end of the day, you know, even looking at it from a commercial standpoint, people want their music heard and these artists want, wanted to be seen in this thing. So, I mean, you know, I would not say anyone should be deterred from making what they want to make based on the legal issues. Yes, there are hoops you have to jump through and things you have to do. And, you know, I've cleared samples <laughs> for hip hop music before and sometimes it hasn't been easy, but, you know, we got there. I mean, you know, so it can be done. Um. Hey, Mark, can I go back to the Black Joy? Yeah, uh, oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. If I may, uh, if, you know, here's the thing. Our media has a perception that they've been running regarding Black history, Black present day, that it, there's a lot of negativity in it. And, you know, I'm not Black. Um, my children are, um, I, I hope that I can understand at least the struggle and that struggle needs to be documented. And it's a part of our history, whether we try and romanticize it or deny it or not. But I think it's incredibly important what Nelson said, because it, black joy is huge, infectious. The fact is, is that black culture is so deeply a, a 
part of not not only a part of our culture of America, but also it's in everything we, we do, whether it's a high five to your kid on a soccer field or a fist bump or a man or whatever it is, it is absolutely 100% braided into every single piece of this country. And to see black joy raises all of us. And when I, when I saw Nelson say that and, and heard that, I just thought that is, that is such a quintessential part of Soul Train of this piece and, and of what we need to show more of because it is inherent in our, in our existence of every race. So I just wanted to say thank you for saying that because it, it really, that was, a, that was a good interview. It was. Um, Musa, I want to bring you back in for a moment. Um, since, since you are the Harlem ambassador. Um, I don't know whether that he's still with us. Um, so I, I'll pass it on to, to Beth and, and Robert. Um, who was Tony Lawrence? <laughs> um, and, and, and the reason why I really wanted to pull Musa into it, because there's a way in which like, you know, Musa is a contemporary version. <laughs> of who Tony Lawrence was. I'm like hearing this, that now. This, <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I'm, you know, it's so funny. You know, what's funny about that is um, like what you just said is just how that influenced me and, uh, uh, you know, being a part of that in terms of uh, as a child. And it really made me want to be able to give back to my community a lot like Tony Lawrence. And ironically, um, I do a lot of uh, free events in Marcus Garvey Park. And one of the things, the last, the last free event that was done in Marcus Garvey Park, I, I produced the 45th anniversary of Claudine, the movie Claudine. And that happened in October tw of 2019. And I, so I'm on the stage hosting that for like, 300 community people. And then ironically, we come up, we're in a pandemic in 2020 and I'm in the full film. So that's <laughs> the next film was Summer of Soul. But I have been doing that. Been doing different projects in Marcus Garvey Park, been on the board. And I would always reference as a child, I was taken to the park and I saw this incredible concert. And people, some of people remembered, some people didn't. And, um, but it influenced my life in terms of, uh, of wanting to give back and, um, you know, and seeing Tony Lawrence um, on camera, you know, cause I didn't really remember him so much as a child. I was, I was too transfixed on Marilyn McCoo. <laughs> okay, she had, she, I mean, come on. Any guy, you know. As we all about, were, She's just right? too beautiful. And, and Florence and so, LaRue wasn't uh, no joke either. <laughs> Right, so I don't. I barely remember Tony Lawrence, but 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 when I look at him, I say, "Oh my God!" I see traits of myself. Um, in just terms of he gave back, I think a lot of credit needs to go to him. It was kind of his concept. His, you know, it was his idea um, to do something like this, and I think him along with Hal Tochin, we're here today. You know what I mean? It was a collaboration of a black man and a white man that came together at a turbulent time. I grew up, guys with Black Joy. I grew up it, seeing the media uh, talk about my community in a negative light and not really understanding that because I grew up with a lot of people that you saw in those films and they were good people, hardworking, loving people. Listen, there's crime in every neighborhood, right? But it just seemed that they focused on Harlem in New York or the Bronx or whatever and sort of said, this is where all the crime is. This is where it is. And it wasn't true. I grew up with a lot of wonderful people and I love that the movie shows that too. And that's what Tony Lawrence, Tony Lawrence and Hal Tolchin really, and, and then of course all the acts really wanted to show the world that the very place that they put on this sort of, um, you know, made it depicted it a certain way, we're gonna show it another way. And, and I'm so grateful that 50 years later, you know, a lot of factors came together. I, I, they found me on Facebook. I was found on Facebook guys, so social media played a hand in this coming together. And I was the first interview that they had, but I had the most vivid memory of all of them as a four-year-old kid. 
you know, and I've had it in my head for 50 years. And so now to see it um, this in this way, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you guys for our community, I live in a community. I'm there every single day, okay? I talk to the people every single day and people come up to me that were there and they're crying and they're, you know, um, you know, they've seen their parents on the uh, on screen, some of them um, for the first time, you know, alive. Um, you know, I know uh, this one woman caught me on the street and she said, you know, I saw my mom on the film. I lost my mother at four years old, the same age you were, but I got to see her in this movie. And I wish, I wish I had to take more time with her and got her name and number because she would have been someone that would have been great in this type of setting to talk about the impact, you know what I mean? But that's the impact that it's had locally in terms of Harlem. This is, their, this is, this is a, a part of our history now and now part of um, history period. So I'm glad that we have it. I'm glad to be a part of it. And um, I wish Tony Lawrence was around because I have a lot of questions for him. <laughs> a lot of questions. You know, Boosie, you have one of the most poignant comments um, that comes at the end of the film. Um, and, and this goes to the point of, of cultural memory, um, yeah. you know, where you're like, you watched the film and you realized that you weren't crazy, right? That, that what you thought you had experienced was actually something that you had experienced and, and, and you were going around for 50 years, right? With, with doubts right. about whether or not this actually happened. Yeah. What does it mean yeah. to be able to recover stuff from black archives that has that kind of impact? on black folks, right? I thought I had dreams. Well, I can only, yeah, um, I can only talk personally. You know, I, I know, I'm, I'm sure for everybody, it has a, a, an impact or it means something, you know, it's a personal thing for me. You know, you gotta understand that when I saw, I, I didn't know a film, the footage existed. And so when I was interviewed, I just told Questlove and the producers, I'm just gonna tell you what I know. And Questlove was so incredible. He was, he guided me, you know, in terms of, you know, throwing me the right questions, of course. And I just was able to unleash and just like, um, you know, uh, it was like the best therapy session I've ever had in my life. Um, and when I, we, and, and so when he did show me the footage, that's the end of the film. That's my reaction. And my reaction was, I was looking at and thinking about people, guys, that were fantastic, fantastic mothers, fantastic fathers, an amazing community that, that only existed in my brain. I would tell people, oh, it was a great place to live. And they might think, see pictures of it and go, well, that was a great place to live. All I see is abandoned buildings and, and crack, whatever. And I would say, no. No, you don't understand. And, and to have this validation, now they understand. Now they get it. When they look at that, this, there were no incidents of violence. And let me tell you something, if there were incidents of violence at this uh, festival, you would have heard about it. <laughs> That's would have made the news. Let's go there, guys. It wouldn't have taken 50 years. We would have said, oh, that festival happened 50 years ago, all the violence. But the fact that it was, there was no violence, it was all joy. There was a reason to, I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna say it, to keep it hidden. Yeah. Because there was, that wasn't news for them. That wasn't what Harlem represented to them. So for me, it's a cultural thing that I can share with my children, the community can share with it, and it has a personal meaning for me. But I know it has a personal meaning for our community. And, 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 and the other Harlems and black communities and other communities around the world. I've gotten messages from people, you know, from Spain, from London, um, and they've been affected by this movie in ways that uh, I don't think I could have ever imagined. So I know it's something that um, should be seen in schools. Um, it should definitely be housed in places like the Smithsonian or the African American Museum in DC it would be perfect for something like this. Um, and of course, Schomburg in Harlem uh, is a great place to, 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 for kids to see it, but also in colleges and high schools like we are now, right now, Duke, you know, um, so that they really understand that we were, we were there first. We were there before Woodstock. There was another moment that happened and it was, um, it was fantastic. 
I mean, one of the things I think about when I hear Musa's comments at the end of the film and when I first heard it, when he did his interview was, you know, the innocence that you have when you're four years old romanticizes things anyway. You know, and so part of the reality is seeing that like, man, it wasn't just that I was being protected from a bigger, crazier world because I was four. That's really how it went down. That was really what was happening there. And I think like that's one of the things that that really, for me, makes that a really powerful moment. Yeah. You know, yeah. before I pass it on to Harry Jones to bring this to a close, um, one of the times that local New York City television actually came to the festival, uh, they came because they wanted to gauge Black response to the moon landing, <laughs> which occurred the same day, right? And so I, I often have this fantasy, uh, and, you know, Gil Scott Heron never wrote about or, you know, that we know of about whether or not, you know, he was in the park. He was in Harlem, right? So there's a good chance he was in the park at some point doing those six weeks. But but I'd like to think that that moon landing in the Harlem Festival is part of what inspired, you know, his poem and later his song, Whitey on the Moon. Uh, okay. Since that very much was the sentiment of so many of the people that were asked about it, you know, in the park that day. Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm gonna pass this on now. Uh, to do Black alumni leader, Harry Jones. Hey, thanks so much, Mark. Uh, thank you so much for moderating this amazing discussion. Have to give you a huge shout out. Uh, happy birthday. Thank you so much for giving your time to uh, the Duke community this evening, particularly on such a special day for you. Um, I want to thank the panelists again, Beth, Ninth, Musa, and Rob for your time. Um, Beth, thank you so much, especially for your partnership over the years. As many of you know, we've collaborated with Beth across projects now. In addition to this evening, um, we were able to host various events around the country um, with the Off-Broadway show, Turn Me Loose, as well as the amazing documentary, uh, The Rape of Reese Taylor. So thank you again for allowing us to experience your work in such an intimate and uh, insightful way. Definitely want to thank the Duke team, uh, Sterling Wilder. Uh, nothing happens uh, in the Duke alumni space uh, without your amazing support. Gerald Harris, uh, Amy O'Neill, thank you so much as well. Also want to thank our wonderful audience for tuning in with us this evening. I know it's a little bit late on the East Coast. It's a little bit early on the West Coast, but you know, thank you all, uh, whether you're an alumni, whether you're faculty, whether you're a member of the Duke staff or you're a student, uh, thank you so much for attending this, uh, this powerful conversation and event this evening. Um, I want to turn my um, attention over to a couple of uh, upcoming events that we have. Uh, Duke will be hosting the Black Alumni Collective Conference in early 2022, um, and the Black Alumni Collective is a consortium of Black alumni networks uh, from across the globe. It will be a great opportunity to build meaningful relationships and hear world-class discussions from a variety of professors, both from Duke as well as from other universities. It will take place in two parts. Um, for those who cannot come back to campus, um, we have a virtual part on March 12th, and then we have the on-campus portion on April 28th through May 1st. Um, just a variety of amazing panels and topics will be discussed in a great opportunity uh, to meet and to build some meaningful relationships. Um, and with that, I'd just like to say good night, everyone, Forever Duke, and I look forward to seeing you soon.